turning points. <laughs> Sometimes they're right in front of your feet and you don't even realise it. For the first 15 years of my working life, I'd been in the disability world helping people with disabilities. That business ended up getting acquired and I started looking for my next project. And I found it in a place that I least expected it. It was about 11 o'clock at night, just before Christmas. I was on my couch. Everyone in the family was better asleep. I was feet up on the couch, on Facebook, browsing with the TV on in the background. Very uninspiring moment, right? <laughs> but then something happened. A single TV commercial came on. And they were selling reusable shopping bags. Talk about selling. And during the sales pitch, they mentioned one statistic. By 2050, there's going to be more plastic in our oceans than fish. Has anyone heard that quote before? A lot of you. When I heard that, I was like, those bloody sales and marketing people have gone a bit far this time, haven't they? What a load of rubbish, literally. <laughs> but then I got curious, because I didn't really know anything about environmental stuff. I'd been blinkered into disability for 15 years. And I just had that moment going, well, is this 2050 thing actually real? Or is it made up? Or what is the gist of this? So I got off Facebook, opened up a browser, and I typed that quote in. What I found is not, this is not just a marketing hype. It was backed by international scientific research that's been presented at the World Economic Forum. When I found that, I was like, holy moly. I had no idea this was happening right around me. I'd been oblivious to it my whole life. So I started doing a bit more research. As an engineer, I like to know the numbers. We first started making plastic back in the 1950s. And our production of plastic has grown exponentially ever since. In 2015, we hit 320 million tonnes of this plastic being made every single year. This year, 2018, we're on track for 500 million tonnes. If we keep going at this same rate, by just 2020, we're going to hit 1 billion tonnes of this each year and growing. Now, if we actually map the recycling of this product on this same graph, it looks a little something like this. In 2013, roughly 9% of the plastic we humans manufactured around the globe actually got reprocessed and turned into new products. Anyone good at mass? What's left over? 91%. We've got one person good at mass. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, there's only three places this bottle is going to end up if it's not reprocessed. Land, water, or air. Our space explorers haven't yet started taking our rubbish up into space and dumping it just yet. Well, they kind of like working on that. We've got a few years until that happens, I think. So in terms of land, we either dump it legally, called landfilling, or illegally, calling, called littering. In our waters, it's rivers and oceans. We don't actually dump a lot into our oceans. It gets dumped into rivers around the world. But where do our rivers flow out to? Oceans. And air... It's not some crazy loony throwing up for a second. It's waste incinerators. We simply burn this stuff, sometimes collecting some of the energy required to make it, but releasing a whole heap of pollution at the same time. So when I started finding out this, I was like, this is bad. What can we do about it? And I started asking my friends, who recycles? Who here actually has a recycling bin at home? Who uses it? Right. We pretty much all recycle. We've been putting this stuff in our bins, in our recycling bins for decades. So my first reaction was, let's go find out what we do with our plastic here in Western Australia so we can teach the rest of the world to care for our planet, the planet that my beautiful two-year-old is inheriting from us as temporary custodians. And I started looking into the statistics of it. Here in Western Australia, we recover about 4% of our plastic in our recycling bin system. A measly 4%. That means 96% we, the citizens of West Australia, do not bother putting into a recycling bin. 
pretty shocking, isn't it? But putting it into that magical yellow bin, for the stuff that does go in our bin, that is just the start. That is not the end of recycling. Here in Western Australia, we have zero plastic reprocessing facilities. Zero. Not one piece of plastic that any one of us has ever put into a yellow recycling bin has ever been reprocessed in Western Australia. On a global scale, that makes us equal last place. <laughs> no one in any state around the world does less than zero. What do we do with it? We put it on a ship and we send it away. And we make it someone else's problem. And we think our job is done. But if we track what happens to this stuff when it leaves our port on a ship and lands in another country, we wouldn't be so happy if we knew the full truth. That waste incineration. China has a number of these industries around that generate cheap electricity for their industries, for the products that we buy back, because we as a developed country are willing to send our rubbish to them. It's a cheap fuel source for them to burn, although it can release up to 30 times the level of pollution as burning coal. Sure, they do do some of that 9% reprocessing, but China's been taking in more than 50% of the world's recycled plastic. Nine out globally, but 50 in. Again, any, where's that one mathematician here? <laughs> you and I know there's a bit of a discrepancy there, right? If you look at all the plastic that's coming into our oceans, 95% of it is coming from just 10 rivers in the world. Eight of those surround one region. That region is the region where we, as West Australia, and half of the rest of the world have been sending their recycled plastic. Isn't that interesting? But we can't just blame China and these other countries, because they're rubbish. And it's not just happening overseas. Standing right behind where we are right now, the beautiful Swan River. I was out there a few weeks ago, about eight weeks ago now, with my two-year-old daughter, Savannah. We were watching dolphins frolicking around. A few moments later, a baby calf popped out alongside one of the dolphins. The smile on Savannah's face was priceless seeing a baby dolphin. That brought so much joy to me to be able to share that with my daughter. One week after that exact moment, we saw in the media that dolphin died. He got tangled in plastic. And a week later, the calf also died because it was too young to survive without its mother. This is right in our own very backyard, not just in some country, somewhere else around the world. Lucky for us, China, a while ago, announced they were cracking down on this. As of January this year, they banned the importation of mixed plastics. That's great. Great globally. A bit of a challenge for our local recycling industry because we don't have reprocessors. So right now, our recycling industry is struggling because they can't just send it to China anymore. The current solution is let's just send it to another country. Malaysia, Thailand, Bangladesh, who knows? Who cares? Because once it leaves our port, it's not really our problem anymore, is it? Or is it because we all share the same oceans and there's no magic wall? There's no planet B when we mess this one up. To give you an idea of the scale of this problem, every second, 1,500 of these around the world get dumped into landfills and oceans. If I was to sit here and meticulously line up 1,500 of these, it would reach from the ground level of the Eiffel Tower to the very top 254 metres up. Every second. I can't stack them that quick. But we don't just produce plastic for one second. We do it every minute, every day, every hour, every month. So if we were to flop that Eiffel Tower on its side and line up the 254 metres end to end and point to the East Coast, to Sydney, and get in our car and race it, assuming we didn't have to stop for toilet 
or fuel or sleep, and we didn't speed, it'll take us roughly 41 hours to drive. The bottles will get there in just three hours. Every three hours, we dump enough plastic bottles into our oceans and landfills to reach from Perth to Sydney. So the bottles get there 38 hours before us. There's a great big mound, a lot bigger than this. This is about 0.1 of a second. That big mound of bottles, if we continue this exercise and start wrapping it around the equator, it'll take us about 45 hours to fly nonstop. The bottles will wrap the equator every 34 hours. China brought in this ban in January. We're now 10 months in. That's a bit of a worry. What's happening? We still don't have a reprocessing plant in WA. What's interesting, big buildings storing big amounts of plastic going up in fire. Again, have you ever seen plastic spontaneously ignite? Isn't that interesting? This is not me reporting this. I believe it's time for action. We need to hit that turning point. Now. Does anyone disagree? No? So, last year, I quit my job, sold my house, and committed to creating WA's very first plastic reprocessing plant. We put it out to a crowdfunding campaign. I know there's a few of you in here that support this campaign. It was one of the biggest campaigns in WA. And this is not to support a new tech gadget or a Kickstarter. It's to do the right thing with our bloody rubbish for the first time. It was one of the biggest campaigns in WA. Since then, the plant we had designed back then, we were looking at doing 300 kilos a week as a pilot plant. We got an engineering company, Wally Parsons, agreed to do this, the engineering pro bono. And we gave them the scope of designing the machinery that could do 300 kilos a week on a $150,000 budget. A few weeks into the project, they came back and said there's a bit of a problem with your scope. The smallest plant they could design does about 300 kilos an hour. They just don't make little recycling plants. To give you an idea of how big that is, that's 15,000 of these every hour which run continuously over the course of a year, there's 130 million of these that we save from going to landfills, oceans and incinerators right here in WA. And the good news about this, that plant is going to cost just $150,000. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so thanks to UWA, we had been offered a small little 150 square metre lab for our 300 kilo a week close. Wasn't quite big enough for this new plant. They came to the party and gave us a great big warehouse out in Shenan Park. And we were hoping to get the keys for today to be that turning point. We didn't quite get there, but it's a whisker away from opening the doors into our plant to start fitting it out. Aco Gas heard about this project. They loved it so much, they've offered us a solar farm to put on the roof of our factory so we can run it off solar energy, reducing our environment, our coal output. The Water Corp heard about this. We need water to wash the plastic bottles and that sort of stuff. Where our building is, is right behind the water treatment plant. At the moment, they treat the water and pump it out into the ocean. So what they're doing now is directing it to our factory so we can wash the plastic and put it back in so we're not using a single drop of fresh water in this project. We've now been working with Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs and different community groups to actually fundraise and sponsor that $150,000 worth of plant and equipment. In one week, two weeks' time, I'm off to China to go visit the factories that make this machinery so that we'll select our equipment, which is a very exciting milestone in this project for Western Australia. Um, and we've got a couple of companies that have come on board to help us with the commissioning and the installation of it. The first product we're making is this stuff. We're turning these bottles into 3D printer filament, which we're giving to schools across WA. We've got 168 schools collect on, in partnership with us already, um, waiting to collect bottles so we can turn it into filament, give it back to their kids, and they can start making stuff on their 3D printers out of recycled bottles. But this is just the start. It's a long road ahead, a long track ahead. 
there's a lot more plastic than what we can turn into filament. Lucky there's other things we can make out of recycled plastic, like railway sleepers for Metronet. Wouldn't that be nice if our state government supported this? But it's not just that. Pretty much anything that's made out of plastic around us can be made out of recycled plastic. And lots of things that are not made out of plastic can also be made out of recycled plastic. So until the day happens that not a single piece of plastic goes in a landfill, a waterway, or an incinerator, we've got plenty of work to keep us busy. So my turning point was right in front of me. And it had been my whole life. Is there something in your life that could be your turning point that you haven't even seen yet? And when it does kick you in your face or you trip over it, will you do something about it? I found there's three keys to success in this world in doing this sort of cut stuff. Those three steps. Passion. You've got to care about this stuff. If you don't care, well, you're really going to get out of bed for the two years, the five years, every day to keep on slogging away. That's what it takes. You've got to take action. You can't just talk about it. Me standing here ain't going to recycle these bottles. You need to do more than just talk. And the final step is you've got to have that resilience to keep on going every time you get the knockback or the no or the reasons why we can't or shouldn't or whatever silliness gets in the way, you've just got to keep going. For me, when you're living in that space of purpose and passion is when we find true meaning in our lives. It's not just about having a nine-to-five job to earn money, to pay bills, to do some stuff on the weekend that you enjoy. You actually do it all day long, every day long. That action. If we all waited for every traffic light to be green before we got in our car and came here today, you'd still be in bed. Sometimes you just got to get started and jump into the unknown and commit. And that final step, that resilience. Quitters never win and winners never quit. You just got to keep going until you get to the end. So I want to leave you with this last thought. Are you just living in a world of fate and letting whatever happens? Or are you going to choose to change your legacy? Thank you.